Well, finally, we are able to get out in the garden and it is an absolutely glorious day. I think it's gonna get up close to 70 today. And it kind of is what prompted the topic uh, on this Wednesday walkabout. Beware this type of gardening. And what kind of gardening is that? It is jump the gun gardening because it is faux spring right now. And it feels as if we can just get out there and start cleaning up and start planting and start being very, very aggressive in trying to beautify our really decrepit, tattered, cold brown gardens. I know I am so ready to do that. But we're gonna to talk today about some things that I definitely put in the category of jump the gun gardening gardening. Don't do those things, but I will try to give you a corollary of something that you can do. So Stuart, what do you say? Sure. Okay. Now you may recall right before we had that Arctic blast come through that I was admonishing everyone to really mulch things very, very well using, uh, you know, different kinds of mulch. But in my case, I would just use lots of leaf litter. So I literally blew all of the brown leaves that were in the vicinity on top of things like my hydrangeas, some of my perennials, the agapanthus, because I really wanted it to protect the root ball, not only to prevent kind of frost heave of my perennials where they literally heave and then um, are exposed out of the soil in the freezing thawing process, but also because it just got so, so cold that I wanted to protect the root balls of the perennials, of the hydrangeas, of even my boxwood from those zero degree temps, and to a certain extent, even the top growth. Now it is right now, the last day of, of January, and we still have all of February ahead, temperatures to the contrary, it feels just like <laughs> spring. So would I really like to come through here and hand rake or delicately rake all of the leaves off of these perennials and cut these perennials back. Yes, I would. Am I going to do that? No, I am not. Because we've got all of February ahead. Sometimes February here in Oklahoma is even colder than January. And I don't want to clean them up only to have them succumb at the last minute to a hard freeze. But what can I do? Well, let's go down here. But what I can do to start beautifying things and making my garden look a little bit more kempt, number one, I can pull out any dead plants, like these sad, sad uh, touch of gold hollies, and I've pulled them out of the urns up front. I'm going to discard them. And then since this all of this leaf litter is really not protecting anything. All it's done is just accumulate here at the bottom of the steps. I am going to start cleaning up this with these wonderful little, I know, where were they? With these wonderful little hand rakes. And then obviously I, I know, obviously I don't have a big enough bin to do this, but these are all things that I can start cleaning up and I can transport some of these to my compost pile. Sadly, all of them will not fit, but I will have some help later. The guys will come in, they will help me clean this up and then they will take them to a larger compost pile over at Kalos. So the other reason that I wanna clean these up is not only because they really don't look very attractive, but also because when we are coming down the stairs, I can't see the bottom step. And that is really, look, see, there's another step down there. So while I don't want to clean up all of this leaf litter off of plants that are in the ground where I am using them for insulation, I do want to clean them up anywhere where they have collected it is unsightly and more importantly, that it's treacherous. Another type of jump the gun gardening is something that is really typically not too much of a problem here in Oklahoma because we tend to be on the dry side. Our gardens tend to be on the dry side, but in many, many areas, you really need to wait 
till the soil dries out because if you work it when it's too wet, you can ruin the tilth of the soil. So you're not gonna wanna be doing any planting until that soil is dry enough to work. And what do I mean by that, by ruining the tilth? Well, here my soil tends to be like heavy clay. So if I work it when it's too wet, and actually right now for me, it's not too bad, but if you work it when it's too wet and it's heavy clay, then what that does is it just makes those clay clumps really just solidify and it ruins the tilth of the soil because what you really want is that chocolate cake friable soil. So do not jump the gun and start digging in your dirt to plant trees, which you can do right now, or certain evergreens, which you can do right now, uh, but only if your soil is dry enough. So what can you do? Well, when your soil is dried out enough, you can plant, as I said, not only trees, it's a great time to plant trees, it's a great time to plant certain evergreens, but you can also plant, as I am doing, some of the spent forced bulbs that you have been enjoying inside your home. So I got a bunch of hyacinths. These were blue. I also have some white ones. I probably showed you where I had them displayed in the cottage. Now, unlike tulips, uh, paper white narcissus, those are kind of one-shot wonders. And once they're done, the bulbs just need to be composted if they've been forced. But that is not the case with hyacinth or muscari, uh, miniature daffodils, those kinds of things. I do save the bulbs and I can go ahead and plant them in the ground in this area, which is now going to be my minor bulb garden. You may remember that I had one at the other house. It was underneath one of my redbud trees in the backyard. But here is where I will plant drifts of these hyacinths in my my um, signature colors in this white and in this blue, and I'll plant them in drifts. Now, will they bloom again this year? No, this is an investment in the future, but it's also an investment in saving money because I've already paid for these bulbs once and I don't wanna pay for them again. So once the soil is really dried out enough, and I can ensure that I've got good drainage, I can come in here and I can plant these bulbs. If you have a strictly hot season, i.e. mostly in Oklahoma, a Bermuda or a zoysia lawn, you do not want to fertilize right now. You wanna wait until the first hint of green starts to show itself. And that's not going to happen for two to three months. What you can do is you can aerate it if you need to. And if you have already overseeded, like with a ryegrass, like I have done over my Bermuda, then you can, oh, let's just say conservative, conservatively fertilize. That's hard to say. So if this were strictly Bermuda, I would not do anything. But since I've got it overseeded with a perennial rye grass, you can't tell now because it's so, it's been so cold that even the rye grass has browned. But I want this rye grass to really green up and be beautiful and lush once the tulip show starts. So around the 15th of February to the 1st of March, I'm going to apply a light layer of melorganite, which is an organic fertilizer. I'm going to just apply it to these areas that are overseeded. The areas that are between the sidewalk and the street both here in front of the cottage and along the side, that has not been overseeded. So I'm not going to touch this lawn. Again, if I felt like the soil was really, really compacted, I could come through and I could aerate it. But I don't think I need to do that because we did that last spring. So that's the difference. Do I or don't I fertilize if it's a hot season grass, no. If you've got a cool season grass, yet, yes. But I would hold off till about February 15th or the 1st of March. And again, that's milorganite. I get it here at Ace Hardware. You can sometimes find it at Home Depot. And yes, it is organic. 
Now, as much as I would like to start pruning and shearing on my boxwood to start transforming these shrubs into beautiful rounded spheres, I am not going to do that now. Now, why? Even though when I look it up on, I think it's the OSU Extension website here in Oklahoma City, they say you can start pruning boxwood and evergreens, but I, I don't think so. And here's why. My garden journal tells me not to. When, <laughs> whenever I have pruned it prematurely, we will inevitably have a hard frost and then any new growth that comes out as a result of pruning, let me back up a little bit, because pruning forces new growth, okay, today. You know, the garden thinks, oh my goodness, it's spring. So if I pruned this back now, and then we have two weeks of these above average temperatures, it's gonna start putting out new growth. Then the temperatures are going to plummet and any new growth that comes out is not going to be tempered to the cold. So I'm not going to do that now. When am I going to do it? I am going to do it once I start seeing a new flush of growth. And for me, that's going to be sometime in March. I'm especially going to be cautious because I face south. It gets lots of sun, lots of warmth. And as soon as I would prune it, prune it, especially if we got some rain, it would want to start sending out new baby leaves. If this were on the north side of the house, it wasn't getting a lot of sun, it would stay dormant far more easily, then I might consider it. But in my case, it's know thy garden. So beware of pruning any kind of boxwood, euonymus, things like that right now. You might be able to do it safely, but we never know what mother nature has in store. But something that I am going to do is I am going to take just a few cuts. Uh, I, well, I'm not sure. <laughs> this is that Bambino pineapple guava, which I thought had really endured. It endured the first cold wave, but I don't think it, it could handle that ice storm we had. Now, I am not, in case it's alive, I am not gonna do any kind of radical pruning on this, nor am I going to completely rip it out. What I am going to do is do a sample cut. And I'm gonna do a sample cut. Oh, I could do it just about everywhere. I'm gonna be looking for green. And you know what? There might be, it's hard to tell, there might be a little bit of green. So I'm not going to prematurely cut this back or rip it out. I'm going to be patient. I'm going to wait and see. The other thing is, if this one cut does start putting out new growth, then I'll know, oh, it's not dead. <laughs> and it will tell me that there is still viability to this plant. So that is what I am not going to do. And I am definitely not going to remove the plant in its totality until I know it is really sincerely dead. Now, what am I gonna take out? We'll come over here. Now, a common sense uh, thing that I think we probably all do when we're so anxious to get out in the garden and we don't want to cause any damage, we can do chores like taking inventory of our garden tools, getting them sharpened, locating them if we're not sure where they are, and maybe even adding to our tool inventory. And in my tool inventory, things that I find indispensable are different kinds of weeders for different kinds of weeds. And I thoroughly enjoy weeding this time of year because the soil is moist, it's easy to extricate them, and I get immediate gratification. So depending on what type of type, and I would even say size of weed it is, I will use one or the other of these, these implements. Now in this case, this is just like some rye grass or crabgrass, whatever. This is that hoary quarry knife that I love so much. Notice how it was all cleaned <laughs> before I started using it this year. So this type of thing, it's just so gratifying. And I don't wanna to take too much soil along with it. Likewise, this weed, which I know has more of a tap root, 
this is also good for that type of application. Now, if I have small start, small seedlings of henbit, or I have low growing weeds like this, then sometimes I find that this scraper weeder works a little bit better, especially if I just have small seedlings or if I'm wanting to scrape something off of the surface like that clover. In that case, that really works well. Now, in other cases, I might want to use this cobra head weeder and it comes with a protective rubber coat on the end that really doesn't want to come off. I think maybe it melted on there. There, I got it. It just required a little bit of tenacity. Thank you guys for your patience. <laughs> now, these weeds right here, I, I mean, I can use this, but I prefer to use this for other kinds of things where I'm really working in tight spaces. Right now, all of this is just so pliable that it works really easy. Um, but this would also be good. Sadly, all of my weeds are already pretty large over here. But if they were here, here we go. If they're small, like this little thing of hen bit right here, okay, then look how easily that comes up. Well, you said for tight places, that thing would get in and get a tiny thing. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah. It's hard to get yeah. a big thing. But it's just the right tool for the right job. So I can come in here and in relatively short order, I can get rid of all of these weeds and I can do it all up and down this expanse along the west side of this bed. But the other thing is I'm going to have all of this weeded and looking really nice and beautiful when these Encore Azaleas come into bloom, which is another reason that I really want to get this area tidied up and also because this would be some more real estate if I wanted to plant some more hyacinths or things like that that I might have in my bulb inventory. Okay, let's move on to our next Beware This in Jump the Gun Garden. Now you may recall that I planted a huge drift of agapanthus from the Southern Living Plant Collection. Most of them were indigo frost, which are supposedly uh, cold hardy, I think down to almost zero degrees, and hopefully those made it. But I had other varieties as well. I am very, very tempted right now to remove this frozen mushy foliage that is uh, kind of just mounded around the tubers of the agapanthus. But am I going to? Oh no, because it might get cold again. This is protecting it to a certain extent. And if there is any chance it survived, I want to give it that chance by not removing this foliage. Now, one type of thing that I am going to cut back because these may have been, you know, they may prove to be annuals, but one annual that I am going to cut back right now or start to cut back and tend to and or groom, and that is all of my pansies and violas. I've planted them all up and down in the landscape. I've got them in containers, and I do know that they still have life in them. They can really, really handle their uh, brutally cold conditions before they succumb, and you can see that over here. They may look really awful, but you can see that there's still lots of green on them. So I'm gonna take off my sunglasses so I can really see where to cut. So while the tops are nipped and brown, nevertheless, underneath, there is still lots of green. And by pruning them back or cutting them back or deadheading them, whatever, grooming them, whatever term you use, this is going to force new growth. And in this instance, I want new growth to come out because I know if it does, it can handle the cold temperatures. And the other thing in Oklahoma and in the South, pansies and violas have a relatively short lifespan because it gets hot so fast. 
they do their best in temperatures like we have right now. And I want them to look their best while they are doing their best. So in this case, I am going to remove the mulch around them and I'm also going to tidy them up. I'm going to deadhead them, cut them back to encourage bushiness in the event any of them look kind of leggy. And then believe it or not, in a couple of weeks, if not sooner, because it's so warm, I'm gonna start giving these a gentle feed. And what do I mean by a gentle feed? This is one of the few things in which I do not practice organically. I am not an absolutist. Most of what I do is organic, but this is one case, including my container plantings, where I will use miracle Grow on a hose end sprayer. So I can come back in here and it just really, it's like, oh, it's like pansy caffeine. <laughs> it, will just, it will just really get them some energy to start being beautiful at a period of time when they want to be beautiful. So unlike the Agapanthus, I am not going to hesitate to start grooming, cutting back, and deadheading all of my violas and my pansies. Now don't, not only do you want to not be premature in cutting back your plants and cutting back your evergreens and some of your perennials, you also don't want to be premature in discarding and removing all of your garden debris. And what do I mean by that? And this is my question of the day. <clears throat> what interesting, crafty, innovative, resourceful things do you guys do with some of your garden debris? And here's my example. So I was out walking yesterday on this absolutely beautiful day and underneath a weeping willow tree were all of these branches, okay? And look at how pliable they are. And instinctively, what does that tell you they would make? <laughs> they would make a wreath. And so I decided that I wanted to start making some wreaths, maybe not for Valentine's Day, but wreaths that might simulate big bird's nests for Easter. Um, so I just, I just came out and I just started to play. So <laughs> using, I, I, yeah, because, you, you but yeah, be, because gardening, gardening is play. Okay, so you guys recall I asked you, do you save um, the wire rings that go with your Christmas wreaths? Okay, and I have just dismantled one. And now, of course, I don't know what I did with a wire wreath to show you, but you guys know what I'm talking about. It is a coated metal wreath form. All of this is attached to it. And I just, took all of this off, I will be composting it, and I could have used it to make these wreaths. But instead, all I did was use the wire and I'm making my own wreaths. Now this one is not finished. And then I decided, and I'm not going to show you how to do this today, this will be another video because I've already taken up too much of your time. But I also had some Dusty Miller and I thought, ooh, even when that dries, that could be beautiful on a wreath and then I can adorn it with maybe some other remnants of the garden. But here is what I did. Again, you don't have to have a wreath form. You just take, and this is the easy way. So I've got this pot that I just that I just removed a dead plant from, and it makes the perfect template to make some kind of wreath. So here's another one that I started. And basically all you do is you just start weaving it around. And that's what I've done. Yeah. And you guys have done this. It's not, it's not rocket science or anything, but it is a way that you can use garden debris, whether it is, um, oh, whether it's, oh, any kind of cutting off of, of any kind of pliable shrub tree, or in this case, a weeping willow, you could use trumpet vine, you could use, obviously, um, grapevine, you could use, um, oh, you could use anything that again is pliable enough. And then what this does is it just kind of gives you a template. And then if you need to, you can use bits of that wire. 
It's all about reuse, recycle, repurpose. You can use bits of that wire to secure it even more. But see how I've got to start there? And then all I'm doing is just taking this and weaving it around. It's very, very gratifying. I think I have showed this in a video before. Yeah, yeah. But it's a way that you can get a perfectly round, a perfectly round wreath form that then you can tuck other kinds of, ooh, if I had some dried celosia or if I had any kind of dried bay leaves or dry herbs, I could put them in here and it would be, it would be just gorgeous. So there you go. Don't overlook the potential of garden debris in your own garden or on your walks when you are out and about. Please answer the question of the day. What kind of crafty things do you do with garden debris in your own yard? And I hope you enjoyed this Beware <laughs> of Jump the Gun Gardening Wednesday Walkabout. Well, today's outfit du jour is all about protecting yourself from the sun. And one of my resolutions this year, gardening resolutions uh, for 2024, was to really start protecting my, my skin better i.e. especially on my forearms and on my arms. And so I'm gonna try to be much more disciplined about wearing these farmer sleeves. Um, I have several pair of them. They are not uncomfortable. Yes, they kind of do look like I've got <laughs> tattoos on my arms, but nevertheless, I really think that they are brilliant for protecting the skin on your arms, but also on the top of your hands, which is where we often uh, see the first signs of aging. And obviously underneath that I have lots of sunscreen. And then if you don't already have a supply of cool jobs, garden gloves, my favorite garden gloves, to get ready for the onslaught of spring gardening, you definitely wanna do that. Uh, my sunglasses are Ray-Bans off of eBay. My t-shirt is one that some, I don't, I, we sell it I, maybe at the bottom of these YouTube videos, I'm not really It sure. might even be one that's gone away. We might have to bring it back bring if people it want back. it. So people if, need to let yeah, us know if it's yeah. something they would and want. And if you, someone commented, sent me an email saying that, oh, it didn't fit and it was too small and what can I do? Well, I don't really have any control over that. So just, we, do, yeah, we design yeah, we just, the shirts. We, we I do. design the shirts, but just, you know, contact the company in that respect. Um, I have had this little garden um, apron for a while. It actually came from a source out of Australia. Uh, my britches are from Jay Peterman. My boots are high C boots. And here is another bonus tip, not related to outfit of the day. And that is a lot of places right now are going to have some of their last year seeds on sale. I was recently in La Jolla, California, and I went to a brilliant, brilliant nursery. I believe it's called Rogers Nursery. Uh, and look here, I just got all sorts of seeds that Stop were up. half price, yes. Now, maybe they aren't going to be quite as viable, but my garden spaces are so small and I can always, um, I can always double up on the number of seeds I put in there to ensure germination and good viability. And like I say, at half price, it's a gardening risk worth taking. So, that's something you might wanna do next time you go to your garden center.